this working? Yeah, it's working. Great. So we have his next talk, Eric Perlmutter from Sakli, telling us about finding gravity in large and in theory space. Thank you. And thanks to the organizers for hosting this conference and giving me the chance to, to speak. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here. So this talk is about how exactly gravity embeds itself into the space of large N CFTs. I won't answer that question, but we're going to explore some ideas and try to crystallize some things that have been floating around in the literature recently. A holographic CFT is defined as the asymptotic of a sequence of theories, I'm calling TC, with increasing central charge with certain sparseness properties. In, for example, 2D CFTs or 4D SCFTs, central charges can't depend on uh, continuous parameters, so we can think of the label C as the central charge itself. And studies of holographic CFT generally take one of two approaches. The first is to work at finite C, so you solve some bootstrap problem, and then extrapolate to large C as best you can. The other is to expand around infinite C, uh, for example, by studying Witten diagrams or imposing classical constraints on scattering amplitudes in ADS to constrain, say, EFT uh, coefficients, like in these recent uh, dispersive works. And here is a plot from a modular bootstrap study uh, at finite C where the extrapolation is... Uh, this red line here going out to larger and larger C. It's not clear that the first approach has a smooth uh, limit as C goes to infinity, or whether the limit would be unique. And it's not clear whether the second approach must closely approximate the physics at large but finite C. In other words, that solutions can be what I'll call smoothly completed to a fully consistent finite C solution. These are two different bootstrap problems, and they're separated by a kind of barrier at some large but finite C. So if we picture the space of complexified central charges as the Riemann sphere, with, say, C equals 1 as in a 2D CFT at the bottom, and C equals infinity as the, the point is infinity, then the large C bootstrap sort of goes out from the North Pole in some little neighborhood here, and the finite C bootstrap comes up this way. And what we really want to know when it comes to quantum gravity uh, is what things look like there at some large but finite C, but both of these approaches have trouble accessing that point for different reasons. So there are two spaces of bootstrap solutions, if you will. Uh, let's call B infinity the space of bootstrap solutions at central charge C extrapolated to C equals infinity. And let's call this B hat infinity the space of solutions to the large C bootstrap solved order by order around infinite C. These spaces can overlap, but they are not the same space in general. <clears throat> now, in the holographic context, the second approach uh, is computing semi-classical gravity observables. And these can look rather different from their quantum counterparts at finite G Newton. There's recent evidence that boundary observables of semi-classical gravity appear ensemble averaged, which poses certain puzzles for ADS-CFT. It suggests, broadly speaking, that we can reinterpret the large C bootstrap as yet a third type of bootstrap, which would be some kind of averaged bootstrap problem. Something schematically like this, where we have an averaged equation that doesn't just average over the solutions of the traditional bootstrap problem. This has new solutions, and maybe those are the solutions that are relevant for semi-classical gravity. So one can draw a kind of cartoon of this space of three different type of bootstrap problems tailored to large central charge. Depending on the space-time dimension, or how we define this averaged bootstrap problem, this cartoon might change. So for example, the space of large C bootstrap solutions might be identified with a version of the averaged bootstrap, uh, the one would tailor to reproduce observables that look like uh, those in semi-classical gravity. So the traditional interpretation of ADS-CFT is that a quantum bulk theory and its CFT dual live in the space of bootstrap solutions at finite C? And we have no reason to dispute this, but the message is that we need to be careful when we talk about the large C limit. And in particular, a putative theory of semi-classical gravity need not behave the same way as a member of this space BC at any finite value of C. So the questions this poses, to summarize, 
are one, how does one distinguish among solutions to the extrapolated bootstrap, let's call it, the large C bootstrap or the averaged bootstrap? And at what order in 1 over C is there a resolution? Is there a difference, rather? Which of these problems is semi-classical gravity giving us a solution to? And where and how does string theory come in to answer these questions? So the goal of the talk is to explore these uh, notions and to clarify the sense in which the average interpretation is appearing. Uh, there will be two parts to the talk. The first will involve semi-classical um, uh, string theory and ideas 5 times S5 times S5. And the second will involve a um, new type of uh, pure 3D gravity theory, which involves currents. Both of these theories will satisfy all known consistency constraints to all orders in 1 over C. Of course, I think we all believe the first one does, uh, but so will the second. And they admit average and microscopic interpretations with interesting subtleties in the 3D case. <clears throat> in both cases, understanding the constraints of SL2Z will be important. So let's get started. So first, uh, the n equals 4 segment. This is based on a paper from January written with Scott Collier, a postdoc in Princeton, and some work to appear with uh, Hinek Paul and Himanshu Raj, who are both postdocs in Sackle. So to get to the statement about averaging and large n, we need to take a, a route to, through some field theory techniques that were developed to understand um, S-duality in this theory. So we're going to consider 4 d n equals 4 with simply laced gauge group G. There's an exactly marginal coupling tau, which uh, maps from so, so the observables map from the uh, upper half plane into the conformal manifold parameterized by tau pictured here. It's this teardrop where the point is the free n equals 4 theory. I've drawn the fundamental domain of SL2Z because the theory enjoys S-duality, which up to global issues is an identification, or rather an invariance, under SL2Z transformations of tau. So the question we asked was, what are the implications of S-duality for the CFT data, say from the abstract bootstrap point of view? And we focused on SL2Z invariant observables, which I'll call O of tau, uh, which include things like um, uh, conformal dimensions of eigenstates of the dilatation operator and four-point functions of superconformal primary local operators. So the idea was to apply a well-known spectral theory for SL2Z to this case, which is essentially harmonic analysis on the fundamental domain of SL2Z. And so the basic statement is that there's an eigenbasis into which we can expand SL2Z invariant functions, uh, which are square integrable. That means they have nice growth properties at the cusp at infinity. Okay. So I'll quickly go over the eigenbasis. It's, it's not critical for what follows. First, there's a constant term. So the overlap of O with just one. This is just because inner products are defined like so. This is just what we'll call the modular average of O, in other words, the integral of O over the fundamental domain. The second branch is the continuous branch, which are the non-holomorphic Eisenstein series, probably familiar. They obey an eigenvalue equation here, uh, and they're defined on what's called the critical line, where S takes these values here. The star denotes a certain normalization, uh, which is known as the completed Eisenstein series, such that it's invariant under S goes to 1 minus S, and therefore this overlap uh, has that property as well. This is a spectral version of, of SL2Z invariance. And finally, there's this third discrete infinity of what are called mass cusp forms. These two are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the upper half plane. Uh, their eigenvalues are infinite, so there's an infinite number of these. They're indexed by some index n, and these tn are positive real numbers going all the way up to infinity. And these are very interesting to mathematicians, whereas these functions are, generally speaking, smooth. These have various chaotic properties, uh, and as a reflection of that, not a single one of these is known totally explicitly. A ton is known numerically, and a lot is known asymptotically, but uh, nothing is known analytically about these. Here's a picture. Uh, the red curve, so I've squared some of these basis elements and projected onto the zero Fourier mode and plotted as a function of m tau. This red curve is smooth, that's the Eisenstein one. These other curves are jumpy, sporadic, chaotic. Those are the three lowest mass cusp forms. The difference is clear. <clears throat> so back to n equals 4. Why do n equals 4 observables admit a spectral decomposition? Well, in any CFT, well-defined observables are finite for any coupling modulo possible divergences at boundaries of moduli space. Here there's one boundary, the cusp, but that's just where the free theory lives. So these observables are square integrable. 
Contrast this with 2D CFT partition functions, which diverge exponentially at the cusp, uh, which is something that in this paper from the summer where I learned these techniques from uh, my co-authors here, uh, one has to be very careful to, to deal with. Now, ensemble averaging is easy to define in any CFT with a conformal manifold. It's just the literal average over the continuous couplings with respect to some measure. A natural choice of measure, not the only one, is a Zamologikov measure defined by the matrix of two-point functions of the exactly marginal operators. And a nice thing about n equals four is that maximal supersymmetry implies that this ensemble average is actually equal to the modular average. That is, the Zamologikov metric is just the hyperbolic metric, exactly. So this thing appears in the spectral decomposition, therefore. That will be convenient soon. <clears throat> now, there's a lot that this formalism is useful for in purely field theoretic uh, uh, language. This talks about large n holography, so I won't focus on it too much. Um, but for example, the structure of instantons is um, rather clarified here. So for example, if one assumes a widely held mathematical conjecture that the uh, spectrum of cusp forms is non-degenerate, then this implies that the zero and one instanton sectors for any observable actually determine all of the higher instanton sectors uniquely. This is a very strong statement, but it seems to be true. And the appearance of the average here gives a useful formalism for studying statistics of this SL2Z ensemble, as we called it. So for example, there's a nice formula for the variance of any observable O uh, across the conformal manifold in terms of these squares of the spectral overlaps uh, defined here. Okay. Going into in all this in detail will be the subject of another talk, so let me just introduce one very useful observable that will be a, um, a litmus test later, which are the so-called integrated correlators. You take the four-point function of four half BPS operators, two 20 primes, two of the higher OP operators with dimension P. You take the dynamical part, you integrate it against a certain measure in the cross ratios, so this is just a function of tau in the end, <clears throat> labeled by the end of SUN and P. And the nice thing about this uh, judiciously chosen measure is that this can be computed also by localization from derivatives of a mass-deformed free energy. And the upshot is that these are extremely simple in the spectral decomposition. These are really beautiful observables. So here's the answer. There's the average piece. There's the Eisenstein piece. The first thing you might notice is that the cusp form overlap vanishes. Moreover, the integrand here uh, is such that there are no non-perturbative corrections to the weak coupling expansion. That's not manifest here, but it's true. And the perturbative piece is encoded here. And these are simply polynomials, which are all fixed by certain recursion relations by this same object at p equals 2 in the SU2 theory. Um, these observations were, uh, so this, this object was first introduced in, in this top paper. and, and and very nicely studied at finite n and for all tau in the second paper by Dora, Goni, Green, and Wen. Um, and I think this spectral decomposition really elucidates their physical features and explains various observations of that paper and makes clear quite how simple these observables are. Now, we don't understand why fundamentally this happens or for what other observables the cusp form overlap vanishes, but it's certainly a nice feature when it does happen. We'd like to understand this better. Okay, so large n. In the Tuff limit, an observable O will have this genus expansion uh, plus some non-perturbative pieces in N. To develop the expansion from this formalism, the algorithm is clear. This just depends on the zero mode, because non-zero modes are exponentially suppressed in N, and therefore, by the way, so are the cusp forms, which decay exponentially at the cusp. So one just has to plug in the zero mode for the Eisenstein uh, and then develop the genus expansion for this overlap, and indeed, one can show that this admits a controlled expansion, um, which is, whose form is fixed by the existence of the Tuff limit itself. And from this, it actually pops out rather easily that at large and at large lambda, all of this stuff ends up dying away, and the average is all that's left. So for example, for an observable that starts at order n squared, the expansion looks like this, where the leading term is given by the leading part of the average, in other words, the n squared part of the ensemble average. Okay. Now this is the expansion we're normally used to, except we think of this as just the infinite lambda limit of the planar observable. And so we've derived this kind of equivalence for this class of observables in any case, between the strongly coupled limit in the planar theory and the large n limit of the ensemble average. Let's demonstrate this for the integrated correlators. So in the Tuff limit, this was computed in, in this paper uh, in the first place. 
When we compute the ensemble average of these things, as we did, uh, it has this expansion. We see the leading terms match. Okay. So this works. This also extends to all genera in an interesting way. So if you look at a higher genus uh, average, you can take a certain piece of it, so in other words, the, the piece that goes like n to the 2 minus 2g, that coefficient can be shown to be equal to the large lambda limit of the genus g part of the observable O. So at large lambda, this thing might diverge, but this is the finite term that remains after string theory regularizes the UV divergence of the G-loop supergravity. And so it's interesting that the ensemble average is sensitive to the string theory renormalization scheme. Okay, so <laughs> this result has sometimes been labeled as obvious or bizarre, so let me at least address the first of these. If you take large n with fixed tau, the leading term is the supergravity answer, and the subleading terms have the tau dependence. So the leading term uh, would appear to be uh, trivial to, to average. Okay. But if you take the average of any subleading term, it's infinity. So the leading term is not the leading term if the subleading terms are infinity term by term. Perhaps this can be resolved by cutting off the integral, but it's not obvious a priori what to do, or why to do it, or how to do it in an SL2Z invariant way. Although I suspect that this can be done. Um, uh, and so to summarize the, the logic here, large n and averaging don't commute. So our calculation sort of makes this intuitive explanation, which I think is nice, uh, rigorous. Okay, so some comments. The traditional correspondence still holds. The average is just some emergent strong coupling large n phenomenon. Uh, and this applies to the observables you can compute in the supergravity, say correlators of, of light operators. It would be especially powerful if we could compute n equals four averages directly, because then we'd have another route to uh, determining these strongly coupled quantities. I should emphasize we haven't studied heavy CFT data, that is to say things dual to, say, black hole observables. So how does this fit with recent ideas about averaging in general ideas CFT? It is different. We are doing an actual average over moduli in a theory that has moduli. This allowed us to derive a version of the gravity equals averaging slogan, but it should be contrasted with the suggestion of, say, Schlenker and Witten, which is that the apparent averaging in ideas CFT is arising from features of the large n sequence of theories that asymptote to gravity, the difference between the smooth asymptotics and the chaotic actual sequence at finite integer values of n. Now, if you believe that n equals 4 theories are the unique n equals 4 as CFTs, which is not proven, but perhaps a reasonable belief, then this is actually an example, what we've done is an example of averaging over a space of CFTs with a fixed symmetry uh, um, at some large fixed central charge. One might take our results to indicate that this is not how apparent averaging arises in general ideas CFT, that there's some smoothing over n involved. Um, on the other hand, I think we should study heavy black hole observables more closely in this language, whereas so far we mostly focused on the light sector. Okay, so now onto the 3D side. This is based on work to appear with my student, Gabriele Diubaldo. And today we'll focus on uh, ADS with a single torus boundary. So pure 3D gravity can be defined as a sequence of theories which asymptotes at large C to a theory with no primary states below the semi-classical black hole threshold at C over 12 pictured here. This definition can be applied for any choice of the chiral algebra A, likewise on the, on the right with A bar. And the minimal choice is of course A equals Vera Soro. The basic challenge so far in constructing the partition function for a semi-classical theory with these properties is that a sum over smooth classical saddles appears to be inconsistent. There's some essential tension between SL2Z and unitarity. And so the question one would like to ask is, is there a consistent partition function Z grab without off-shell configurations? And if so, which of the CFT problems is it solving? Okay. So what would it mean to find such a theory? Perhaps the holy grail is to find a sequence of quantum theories at finite G Newton. What distinguishes the sequence of pure theories in the bulk, and what really defines them as gravitational in, in a regime where gravity exists in the sense that we understand, is their asymptotic behavior at small G Newton, 
And moreover, there could be multiple non-perturbative sequences that have the same spectral data at, at large C, at small g-Newton. So a more minimal point of view is that our first goal should be to find a theory with the desired spectral gap that's consistent to all orders in a semi-classical expansion. That is, at resolutions much larger than e to the minus s, but to all orders in, in 1 over s. And regardless of whether you think this, is, this really should be our first goal or not, it should be emphasized that this has not yet been achieved. And I won't achieve it today, but we'll look at a slightly related problem uh, in which it seemingly can be achieved. Now, what is the status? Uh, the central calculation in this area is that of what's come to be known as MWK, based on papers by Maloney Witten and then Maloney Keller. Uh, the sum over uh, smooth classical saddles, aka empty ADS and its SL2Z modular images, gives you an SL2Z invariant partition function, which also has this geometric character that we would want in the theory of, of gravity. But it has some issues, uh, famously at this point. The first is that it's divergent, schematically governed by a sum like this. This was regularized in their paper, but one might prefer to work with something that is not divergent. The second is that it has a negative density of states. This was eventually realized to come in two different regimes. The first is near the black hole threshold of scalar states. There's a minus six. This can be sort of cured in some ad hoc way that has no bulk path integral interpretation, but it can be cured. The second is seen as more severe, which is that in a near extremal large spin limit, the density of states becomes negative in some region of, of twists near the, the threshold, where this little t is defined as h minus c minus 1 over 24. And so this t star is exponentially small in the entropy in the spin j sector, but there's a negativity in this small window. Okay. The density of states is also continuous. This was at first seen as a bad thing, but now it's seen as, well, maybe a good thing, or at least not a bad thing. Uh, we'll come back to that. Now, there have been some ways uh, of trying to resolve this. Let me mention the main ones. The first is to add matter. So one can add conical defects to this theory. This cures the negativity, but it brings the gap down to c minus 1 over 16. This is not a pure theory of gravity in the strictest sense. Uh, the partition function also continues to diverge. Um, so we'd like to, to continue to shoot for the stars, although the construction is, is very nice. The second is to add certain off-shell configurations suggested by the reduction to 2D, or the JT interpretation of this near-extremal negativity, which then gets cured by an appropriate inclusion. Um, it's a very elegant observation, and the gap shifts this way and cures the negativity at the same time. This has yet to be made explicit as a 3D calculation. Uh, that would be lovely to see. The last is to put on your ensemble hat. That is to say, to design a probability distribution of CFT data and match it to 3D gravity calculations with essentially any number of boundaries and arbitrary uh, genus. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful set of matches. Uh, the ensemble is not SL2Z invariant, so in particular the spins of the density of states are continuous, and it works saddle by saddle. So there are large sort of problematic contributions that at present, we don't know how to cure if we were to try to make this ensemble SL2Z invariant. This is the tension I was alluding to earlier. So let's make a few conceptual points, then I'll present a construction, and then I'll conclude. So the first point is that the problem with this construction is not that it has negativity. The problem is that it has a lot of negativity. Let's define the total amount of negativity in this negative region by integrating. The total negativity of MWK is exponentially large in the entropy. That's a lot. The second conceptual point is that a continuous density of states above threshold is what we should expect if we were to work to all orders in 1 over C. In a chaotic theory, mean level spacings are e to the minus s, so when we wash over that, it's going to look continuous, and we don't need to average over theories to have that property. This also resonates with recent observations about operator algebras and gravity, uh, so that would be a nice connection to make more explicit. The third point is that when we write a sum over saddles, we really mean this up to exponentially small corrections. For example, the saddle point uh, partition function can itself receive non-perturbative corrections. So the proposal is to just add currents. This actually has surprisingly positive effects. If we consider a theory, and I'll just take a couple more minutes here, a theory with this chiral algebra, where there's some U1 currents and a Virasoro, uh, 
if we consider the usual Poincaré sum as a candidate partition function, then most of these problems actually go away. So this is obviously SL2Z invariant, written as a sum over geometries. Uh, it's not the Vera Soro case. We've added something. It's not matter. These are boundary gauge fields, as we'll see in a moment. But this thing actually converges for d greater than 1. And it's unitary for d greater than 1. In particular, if you look at this total integrated negativity, then for d greater than 1, it's an exponentially small effect. It has a large spectral gap and a continuous spectrum. And so the proposal is that this furnishes a consistent partition function to all orders in G Newton uh, for a semi-classical Einstein gravity coupled to U1 Trent Simons gauge fields on the left and right. You can take a double scaling limit in which C and D are both taken to infinity with C over D held fixed, which interpolates between this regime and a regime which is similar to the bulk dual of the Narain theory, except it's coupled semi-holographically to a small Virasoro sector representing the finite C piece of the theory. Now, boundary interpretations, well, it's the solution of a large C bootstrap problem, as I've discussed. It's an ensemble average of CFTs or CFT data is another possible interpretation. The third is that it's a large C CFT at a resolution much greater than scales e to the minus s. The fact that it checks all the boxes, including SL2Z invariants, allows us to possibly think of this as an average over bona fide CFTs. But there's an interesting wrinkle here. This is the last substantive thing I'll, I'll try to say, which is that in a CFT with this chiral algebra, which generalizes to the case where you have du1 currents, these authors show that actually the twist gap is zero if the CFT has a discrete, finitely generated spectrum. These assumptions don't apply to our construction, so it's fine. But if you try to imagine uh, taking a limit and landing on this, there's a kind of discontinuity in the limit. That working to scales much greater than e to the minus c seems to wash out. So this is interesting. We seem to have a theory of semi-classical pure gravity that exhibits this paradigm articulated earlier, where it can't be smoothly continued to a quantum theory, but it's consistent and has all the physical features we would want that we would call a semi-classical theory of pure gravity to all orders in 1 over c. So it exists in a kind of limbo. Nevertheless, these off-shell ingredients might be necessary. Uh, the average interpretation might be necessary when you think about multiple boundaries. And the Viasoro case remains outstanding. So I've just tried to deconvolve what these ingredients are necessary for and what they are not necessary for in a model that seems worth exploring more. So let me just leave these questions for the future here and end here. Thank you. If we have time for some question. Um, I was intrigued by your comment where you said z zero instanton and one instanton sector determining the rest of the instanton sectors, uh, all of them. Actually, something like this um, of this nature also takes place in simple quantum mechanics problem, such as double well potential, triple well potential, or periodic potential. And in that case, you can use exact WKB to prove that, uh, to show that just the perturbation theory around the perturbative vacuum is capable of producing all of the instanton sectors. It's a relatively new result, an interesting result, but in this case, in the example I told, there is an underlying geometric reason because the, if you think classical uh, relation between energy, energy relation, energy conservation relation of the classical uh, curve, it's a genus one curve, and it comes from this geometrical property, this uh, kind of simple relation. I wonder if there is a uh, underlying geometric reason for, uh, for mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. your case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, that would be nice to understand for sure. Um, there are even cases in N equals 4 where the zero instanton sector determines all the higher ones. You don't even need the one instanton sector. In fact, these integrated correlators are one example of that. Uh, so, so it might be worth understanding in these especially simple cases. Thanks for the comment. So, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. That was a very nice talk. Um, uh, you referred to, so in my paper with Tom and Jeevan and, and Scott, 
um, we proposed thinking of Einstein gravity as an average over CFT data uh, that almost satisfies the bootstrap conditions. And you seem to refer to some exponentially large problem with that, which I didn't quite understand what, what comment you were making. So if you could clarify, that would be great. Sure. Yeah, so um, the, the statement is that um, when one works saddle by saddle, one is missing contributions that for certain values of the quantum numbers can be very largely mm -hmm. bad, say large and negative. Right. Now, there might be a way to engineer an SL2Z invariant ensemble that avoids these issues. I, I'd say I, this is essentially the same problem as trying to write down yeah. you know, a consistent semi-classical pure gravity <sighs> partition function in the first place. This might be possible, but uh, I, that, I'd say, is the sort of issue with the situation currently. I mean, would, would you have any problem with doing a version of the calculation where you imposed all of the bootstrap conditions as opposed to just some of the bootstrap conditions? Like if you just defined a Gibbs ensemble or a maximum entropy a distribution on the space of solutions of all the bootstrap conditions as opposed to some of them? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that would, I don't, I don't think one could argue with, I mean, obviously that's an incredibly difficult calculation to do, but I think that, you know, I think that would address all of, all of these sorts of issues. I hope so. I'm not so sure in the sense that, um, yeah, it, I mean, it's not a priori guaranteed that the theory would have to exist in that sense either, although I, I'm also optimistic, but I'm just trying to put some value on seeing these things done, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with that, of course. Thanks. Um, so uh, my question is, it, uh, for the 3D example that discussed, uh, is it conceivable that uh, this theory that I introduced slightly generalized, say, replaced the uh, you know, real sorrow by looking for real sorrow? Uh, in that case, uh, is it conceivable this is related to uh, ensemble average, well, couple manifold average of more familiar non perturbative uh, ADS 3 CFT2 example, in particular the D1, D5, and D4? Mm. So take the equal to four, replace your rare sorrow by into four rare sorrow. Is it conceivable that your your model actually come from some couple manifold average of that uh, number perturbative setup? Hmm. Uh, so, sorry, a point of clarification because it's a little hard to hear. You, you want to look at the n equals four superconformal algebra with extra currents on top of that? That's right. So so okay. the so the so the model I have in mind is the the familiar d one d five on t four, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which we know the string theory dual. Yeah. Right, so uh, in that case, I um, just want to mimic uh, what you have been discussing from this kind of more bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it seems that naively, if I replace the Verosoro in your construction by the int4 Verosoro, the small mm -hmm. int4 Verosoro, mm -hmm. and then consider the case d equal to four to mimic the you know the the u1 to the four times u1 to the four current on the t4. Mm -hmm. um, could it be that actually your model? would arise as a uh, you know, conformal manifold average of the familiar T4 theory. That's an interesting suggestion. Um, because there's a modulus. Sorry? B because there's a modulus, that yes. would appear as a exactly marginal operator in That's some right. averaged yes. partition function. So it wouldn't be pure in exactly the same sense. But I think that's a nice thing to explore. OK. So that we didn't have the gap, literally speaking, that we have written down. Right. All right. Final question, perhaps? All right, thanks. This is a great talk. So this is a bit more of a formal question. Um, in case I have a quantum field theory whose S2O group is not SL2Z, but something more, um, something more exotic, do you think, and I can do the Eisenstein series decomposition, the um, spectral decomposition of the Laplacians on the, upper, on the fundamental plane, does such a principle of what you just said, do you think, do you expect it to actually hold forward and also trying to understand the holographic dual and the supergravity constructions there as well? For... Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think I, think I heard the question. Um, <laughs> so, so one can, there are spectral methods that can be applied to other uh, algebras, although, you know, not most of the ones you might be interested in. Um, but as for the general principle of whether this type of correspondence might apply there, uh, yeah, I think some version of it would apply in the setting where you have a strongly coupled point, say, you know, a sort of double-scaled limit that takes you out to a gravity regime. Um, but yeah, t turning this into something quantitative would be hard, uh, with the exception of a few simple generalizations of SL2Z, like Hecke triangle groups or um, congruent subgroups. Yeah. 
I think we have to postpone the rest of the discussion to the coffee break. So let's first thank our speaker again and then... Please wait for an uh, announcement, an organizational announcement. Thank you very much. Just very quickly, uh, because some people are already uh, leaving today or early tomorrow. So please return the badges to the conference office or hand it to some of the student helpers. We'll also put a box so that we can re recycle or reuse them. And second announcement is just um, an update. So we're now at five COVID cases. So please be, continue to be careful and stay safe. Enjoy your coffee.